Hello, and welcome to another lecture from the Understanding Deep Learning lecture series. Today we have Le Chao, which is a research scientist in the Brain Team, Google Research. Uh, he works with, on theory of deep learning, including optimization, Gaussian processes, and generalization of neural networks. Uh, before joining Google, he was uh, Hans Hadamacher uh, instructor at the University of Pennsylvania, working on harmonic analysis. He received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 2014, and his bachelor's in mathematics from Zhejiang University in 2009. Le Chao, be welcome and please take it away. Thank you, Charles, for the nice introduction and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to, to give a talk. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about like a work called like uh, this entangling general bridge and generalization in deep neural networks. So this is a joint work with my colleague Jeffrey Pennington and Sam Sorenholz in uh, Google Brain. And so feel free to interrupt if you have any questions uh, during the talk. All right, uh, I will start the talk. So there are three like uh, challenges in understanding uh, deep learning. So the first one is the representation power. So the most classical result is that like a neural network can approximate like a, any nice function. And then this is a very real study in the 90s and of last centuries. And then the second one is about like a trainability or optimization. So the goal of train optimization is to find like the minimum as efficient as possible. So in modern machine learning, the most like a uh, well-known methods are uh, gradient descent and, and its friends like uh, Adam or Ada Grad. So the third one is about generalization, which is the core of deep learning. So we train a model in some like a uh, training data, and then we will evaluate the model in some unseen data. We would like to, our model to like a uh, do well on unseen data. Mathematically, we would like to like measure the generalization gap, which is the loss between the unseen data and the loss of the training data. And then we would like the gap to be like as small as possible. So one dream like uh, in machine learning is to find or design a model together with a fast training algorithm that we can use that to solve like AGI or like even the uh, even the like a Riemann hypothesis. Uh, however, in today's talk, we are going to present a trade-off between trainability and generalization for very wide and very deep neural networks. And we will do this through the so-called phase diagram. And then the phase diagram is defined by two hyperparameters. One is the weight variance. The other one is the bias variance. And then in this phase diagram, there will be like two different phases. One is called the chaotic phase. When the wave variance is relative large compared to the bias variance. And then in this case, we will have exploding of gradients. And then what happens is that the neural network will just memorize the data as we will discuss later. And then the second one is the ordered phase when the variance of the bias is relatively small than the variance of the weight. In this case, we will have an issue of vanishing of gradients and it becomes very difficult to train the neural network. However, if we are able to train that, the neural network usually be, uh, uh, perform nicely. So uh, throughout this talk uh, for generalization, we is defined very loosely uh, about whether our prediction function depends on the unseen inputs. All right, so here are the plan of today's talk. So we will briefly talk about like the background of infinite width neural networks and its connection to uh, Gaussian process. After that, we will mention the phase diagram and then the neural tangent kernels and its connection to the training dynamics. 
uh, after these three parts, we are ready to introduce the metrics for generalization and generability. And then we will use the phase diagram to understand the generability and generalization. If we have enough time, we will cover convolution and the spatial correction from global average pooling and dropouts. All right, let's move to uh, infinite width neural networks. Uh, so here is how one neural network is defined. And then the X is our input. And then we fit in the X into like a neural networks of like a dense layer activation and et cetera. And then output of function F over here. And then mathematically, we can write down the transition function from layer L to layer L plus one as in this formula below. Here, L represent the index of the layer, and N L is the width of the neural network, and phi over here is the activation function. So W I J and and B I L are our parameters, which are sampled from the I D standard Gaussian distribution, and then sigma W square and sigma B square are the hyperparameters which are the variance of the weights and the variance of the bias. They are the most important con uh, hyperparameters throughout this talk. All right. And then we let the width of the neural network go to infinity. And then we can see that the formula is essentially a sum of a large number of random variables. And then we can apply the central limit theorem to conclude that the output will converge to a Gaussian process with mean zero and some kernel KL plus one. The reason that is mean zero because we initialize our parameters to be zero mean. And then as a consequence, what matters at the end is the kernel. So here is the picture that uh, connects neural network and Gaussian process. So at random initialization, when the width of the network goes to infinity, then the output of the function will converge to a Gaussian process. And then this framework is very general, and then it applied to many architectures like FCN, uh, uh, Fourier connected network, convolutional network, self-attention, and et cetera. You can see the reference like on the on the on the corner over here. All right. As such, we can like analyze the Gaussian process kernel K for all the hidden layers. As it is classical, like in dynamical system, uh, we will begin with the fixed point of this like uh, dynamical system. So here is K1 represent the kernel of the first hidden layer and KL represent the kernel of the final of the elf layer. So we can write down the transition map from like a layer to layer, but in this talk, we don't, we don't need to like use them. So you don't need to like pass the, the formula over here. So we will analyze the property of this, this stable, uh, this fixed point K star. And then one trivial fixed point is K one star is equal to Q star times one one transpose, which is a rank one matrix. This happens when all the inputs are identical, which is to say that X, X is equal to X prime in this case. And then we will analyze the stability of this fixed point by looking at the Jacobian of the transition map at the fixed point K star. If this uh, this like a chi one is less than one, then this fixed point is stable, and then we will call this is the order phase. If chi one is greater than one, then this fixed point is unstable, and then it will convert to another new fixed point, which has a very nice structure. Basically, it says that all the diagonal turns are the same, and all the off diagonal turns are different. Uh, sorry, all the off-diagonal turns are also the same. So, which means that 
the correlation of two points either converts to one if they are the same or converts to C star if they are different. In this case, this fixed point is a stable fixed point. And then we will use the stability of this fixed point, which is the magnitude of Taiwan to define the, our phase diagram over here. All right, let's move to the details of the phase diagram. So I briefly mentioned this one because Sam already talked about this one in the previous lectures. So the phase diagram is defined by the stability of K1 star. And then when K when K1 less than one, we call this is the uh, order phase. And then in this case, all the inputs will map into the same output, which means that the neural network as a function converge to a constant function. If the neural network is a constant function, its gradient must be zero. So we have an issue of vanishing of gradients. Uh, in the unstable region when k is greater than one, we call this is the chaotic phase. What happens in the chaotic phase is that uh, the when two points are close to each other, the network will decorate them. In this case, we have an issue of like an exploding of gradients. And then sitting in the boundary, chi one equal to one is the, uh, the critical line. In this case, the gradient only like a diverge linearly. Any questions so far? No questions yet. Thank you, okay. All right, uh, I will move to the uh, your tangent kernel and the training dynamics. All right. Okay, so we need to introduce a little bit notation over here. So F theta is the output of the neural network. So you can think about that just as like any function with parameter theta. And theta is the correction of all trainable parameters. In the neural, neural network setting, it's just the weights and the biases. And then we associate uh, this network with a loss L theta, which is the mean square loss over here. So which is the residual, which is F theta extreme minus the true label. And then we take a square, uh, take the square norm of that. So this is our training uh, objective. And then we apply gradient descent to the to this like a training objective and write down the gradient descent formula for the parameters. And then it's driven the d theta over dt can be written as negative eta times j transpose and then times the residual f theta chain minus y train. So eta over here is the learning rate and j is the Jacobian, which is the gradient of f theta with respect to the parameter theta. So this is a huge matrix. It has number of parameters by number of samples. If we write down the gradient descent dynamic in the function space and then apply the chain rule, then we have the f theta extreme over dt, the gradient of the outputs is equal to the negative eta times j, j transpose. We have an extra j over here due to the uh, chain rule and then times the residual over here. And interestingly, as the width of the neural network go to infinity, the tangent kernel, JJ transpose, converts to a deterministic kernel called the neural tangent kernel. So this was first introduced by Jacobs in 2018, and they proved that this converts to a deterministic kernel, and during training, it will be freeze. So as such, when we consider the infinite width setting, the gradient descent dynamic of the function can be written nicely as follows. So df dt is equal to negative eta times the neural tangent kernel and then times the residual. So this is a constant coefficient ODE, and which means that it has a closed form solution. Then we can solve that. All right, after that, we can talk about metrics for trainability and generalization. So we can solve the equation 
directly because they are a constant coefficient of the e. And then we write down two equations over here. The first one is called the training dynamics, which is the equation for the mean prediction of the neural network applied to the training set. As you can see over here, when t goes to infinity, the exponential term will converge to zero. And then the mean prediction of the training set is just the label, which means that the neural network interprets the data. And then we can similarly write down the learning dynamics, which is the mean prediction, which mu t is over here, of unseen test points. If you are familiar with the kernel rigid regression, so this is the formula for kernel gradient descent. And then if you let t goes to infinity, the formula will just reduce to the kernel rigidness regression solution. And then, so this is a, a cartoon made by my colleague, Rowan Novak. So basically here we want to like measure how good the infinite width network approximates the final width neural network. So we choose like a couple of training points over here, which is the red dots over here. And then we train these like a training set using either infinite width neural networks as a formula given above, or we train that using finite width neural network, but we train a lot of like uh, using different randomness to every string out the, uh, the randomness. As you can see over here, they give like a, the infinite width neural network give a very precise approximation for the finite width ensemble. All right, now we are ready to talk about the matrix for generability which is the conditioning number. All right, as is very classical in linear algebra, the first step is to do uh, eigen decomposition. So we decompose the training NTK into U transpose DU, which is the eigen decomposition. And D here are the eigen values of the kernel. And lambda zero is the largest one, and lambda m is like the smallest one. And then we can decouple the dynamic into individual eigenmode. So we can write down the ith eigenmode as follows over here. So this is a, a constant equation. As such, we can use the conditioning number, which is kappa equal to the largest eigenvalue over the smallest eigenvalue as our generability metric. So if this number is very large, then it will be very difficult for the neural network to learn this small eigenvalue direction because this will converge very slow. However, if kappa is very close to one, then the neural network can learn all the eigen direction very fast. So we will use kappa as our generality metric. <clears throat> now we move to the generalization metric. So here, mu x test is our mean prediction at infinite width. And we will write that as p theta operates on y train, where p theta is just theta test train times the inverse of theta chain train. So we will use this one as the generalization metric. So we want to understand how fast this generalization metric or the mean prediction converts to a constant that's completely independent of the test points, which means that the mean prediction is a constant function. In our case, we'll dis discuss later, this will convert to a zero exponentially fast in the chaotic phase. <clears throat> so our goal of this talk is to understand the evolution of the trainability and generalization metrics x as a function of L. And then we would like to analyze their fixed points and how fast they convert to the fixed points. 
And then one thing useful to keep in mind is that when the condition, when, when the generality matrix is bad is when it is very large because it will be very difficult to learn the small, the eigen direction. And for the mean prediction or the generalization matrix, it becomes bad when it converts to a constant function independent of the test inputs. All right, so we will move to the to understand generality and generalization using the phase diagram. So this table summarizes our result of today's talk. So we will analyze the generalization matrix, conditioning number, the largest eigenvalue, and then the remaining or the bulk of the eigenvalue of the NTK for three different kinds of architectures. So here, FCN represents fully connected network. CNNF represents the convolutional neural network with a flattening readout layer. And CNMP is the convolution neural network with a global average pooling layer. So CNNF and CNMP are the same except the last readout layer. Sorry. And then D over here is the global average, the window size of the average pooling. You can think about this one, D is equal to 32 by 32 in the case of like a CIFAR 10. And then for convolution with a flattening layer, CNNF, we can just think about D is equal to one. The, the pooling size is equal to one by one window, all right? And so for, for, for this slide, let's just ignore the CNN pooling at, at this moment. And then we will talk about a collection coming from CNNP later, all right? So let's look at the order phase first. For the order phase, chi one is less than one, and then we can estimate the largest eigenvalue of the NDK, asymptotically as the depth L goes to infinity. And we will see that it will converge to a constant M times P star, where M is the training set size. And P star is just some constant, depends on the hyperparameters. The bulk of the remaining eigenvalues will converge to zero exponentially fast because chi one is a number less than one. And then if we compute the condition number, which is the ratio between lambda max and lambda m, or lambda the remaining, then we see this number diverge to infinity exponentially fast, which means that the network is very difficult to train. However, even though in this case, the mean prediction still converts to a constant, converts to some number that depends on the inputs, we still preserve some generalization ability in this setting. Now let's move to the chaotic phase. So in this case, the largest eigenvalue will blow up exponentially fast, same as the remaining eigenvalues. And then we can compute the conditioning number. And this number will converge to one exponentially fast, which means that the network is super easy to train. And in the extreme setting, you may only need one gradient descent step to overfit the training set. However, when you compute the mean prediction, you will see that this mean prediction will converge to zero exponentially fast because chi c star is a number less than one and chi one is a number greater than one, which means that the outputs, the outputs of the neural network or the train neural network will just be zero when the depth L is very large. However, in the, on the critical line, the largest 
eigenvalue will come uh, will diverge linearly because we have a L over here. So is the remaining eigenvalue. So all the eigenvalues will diverge linearly, and then you can compute the condition number. So the condition number will converge to a constant MD plus two over two, which is roughly the same as like the, the training set size. And then the mean prediction will converge to zero linearly, which is not so bad. Now we are going to analyze the chainability and generalization metrics uh, in the chaotic phase and other phase separately. So in the chaotic phase, the diagonal turns will diverge to infinity exponentially fast of diagonal turns will converge to a constant. As such, the NTK will essentially the same as a divergent constant common L times the identity matrix. Mm. And then the condition number chi L will converge to one exponentially fast and the mean prediction will converge to zero, also exponentially fast. So this is the plot for the conditioning number. So the x-axis is the depth. And then the y-axis is the condition number. And then we plot like three different architectures, CNMP, CNF, and Fourier connected network. As we see that like all of them just converge to one as the depth around 100 layers. We also plot like the mean prediction uh, given by the P theta Y chain. So the black dash line is our theoretical computation. And then the orange curve is the ground truth prediction. And then we see that they converge to zero exponentially fast. So in this case, the network will not be able to generalize. Any questions so far? Then I will move on. No questions yet. Cool. All right. So the conclusion for the for the like uh, chaotic phases are easy to train but not generalizable. So we'll see one experiment for that. So this is one experiment uh, for the network in the very chaotic phase. So here is the experiment set that. So we choose 10,000 training sets from CIFA 10 and then 2,000 test sets from CIFA 10. And then we apply gradient for batch gradient descent to the network. However, we choose the hyperparameter so that they are in the deep chaotic phase. So sigma w square is equal to 25 in this case. And then this is a very large number because in, in, like, uh, in practice, we will choose this guy equal to like a uh, root two or like a uh, 1.5-ish. And then we choose the bias variance to be zero. And then the network has 12 layers. On the left plot, so this is the loss versus training steps. We see that the loss decays very fast for the training sets. However, you see the test loss in the increase after one step. So the network begin to overfit the data in the first step. And when you take a look at the test performance, you will see that after about like 25 steps, the training reaches 100% training accuracy. However, for the test, it's just almost the same as random, just like a 10%. So in this case, the neural network just memorize all the training data and does not do good in the test, uh, in the test set. All right, let's move to the other phase, which we have vanishing of gradients. So in this case, the diagonal terms of the NDK 
will converge to a fixed constant, P star, exponentially fast. For the off-diagonal terms, it will also converge to the same constant. And then it is almost the same rate, but we have a L correction term over here, which is a polynomial correction. And then when you compute the, write down the formula for the NTK at layer L, is basically a rank one matrix times some constant that converts to zero exponentially fast. And then we can compute the conditioning number because this is close to a, a rank one matrix. So it has one direction that is large and then for the other eigen direction is very close to zero. So the condition number will grow exponentially. And then we can compute the mean prediction. So for the mean prediction, it turns out that it would depend on the inputs, even though the NTK is very singular. So here we plot chi one to the L times K, which means that we move the chi one to the negative L of the formula to the left of the condition number. And then this one goes to, to zero at rate one over L. So which means that the condition number diverge at the rate of chi one <clears throat> to the negative L times uh, over L. And then we plot the mean prediction for different logits and different like uh, test points. So, so this should be like the test points, not the chain point. Oh, so sorry, this, this is like a for the first like a uh, index is for the order of the test point, and then the second is the logits. So we sample them randomly, and then we will see that the mean prediction still depend on the on the input. It's not a constant function like what happens in the deep uh, chaotic phase. So the mean prediction is still meaningful in this case. Because the conditioning number is so large, it's very difficult to train the neural network. But if we can train that, it is generalizable. So this is another plot about our prediction. So this is a heat map. So for this heat map, we choose a 20 by 20 different configuration of hyperparameters and fix the bias and choose like a, and vary the weight variance in the X axis and then change the depth from one to 80. So each point in the heat map corresponding to one configuration of experiment. And then we choose the SIVA 10 and only using like a one K of subsets because this already like a 500 experiments over here. Uh, so I uh, already like a 400 experiments, 20 by 20. <clears throat> and then we plot the training accuracy at the end of gradient descent training. And then the red color represent that the neural network can train very well and reaches 100% uh, of training accuracy. So the white dash line is our theoretical calculation that the network will become unchainable. So be, uh, left to the to the white dash line, the network is not chainable. And then right to the orange curve over here is that the network will not be able to generalize. So this is is by computing how the mean prediction converts to zero. As you see over here, we obtain like a perfect training accuracy on the upper right corner of this heat map. However, when you look at the test accuracy over here, it's almost random, it's like 10 percentage. This says that the neural network just memorized the training data in this upper right corner. In the uh, upper left corner, 
both training and test accuracy is very like uh, small because the neural network cannot train because the condition number is huge. Any questions at this moment? No questions. Thank you for asking. Nice. OK, we still have time. So we will talk about convolution and spatial correction. I think this is one of the most interesting part about the, the theory over here, because we can use that like to, to understand the correction of global average pooling. So D here is the pooling window size. If we apply like a convolution without like a done sampling to C bar 10, this number will be the same as the dimension of C bar 10, which is 32 by 32. And then we can analyze like the mean prediction or mean prediction and the condition number in the first, uh, this column, which is order phase and the critical line and the chaotic phase. When we look at like, uh, for, in for, uh, for instance, the critical line, and then what happens over here is that the condition number will convert to M times D plus two over two. Which means that the condition number is increased by a factor of D if we use pooling rather than use like a vectorization over here which means that the network is becoming much more difficult to train for like a pooling. And this is indeed what we have observed like a, in practice. And when you look at the mean prediction over here in the, in the middle column, you will see that it is increased by a factor of D. So which means that the mean prediction goes to zero D times slower than the CNN factorization. This is good because like uh, this tells us that even for a very deep neural network, convolution with pooling is able to train and is able to generalize. And then this is also a trade-off between like uh, trainability and generalization over here because generalization metric is improved by a factor of D, but the conditioning number or the trainability matrix is degraded by a factor of D. So, so finally, so this like, like the heat map that like to showcase that how the pooling change the behavior of like the region of memorization and trainability and then we will skip this one because it's sort of difficult to pass. All right, uh, we'll finally mention about dropout. So the main message for dropout is that it improves trainability. So uh, let me talk about dropout. So for dropout is like a, a random mass that you zeroing out the, the last layer or some hidden layer and injecting noise to the, uh, to the neural network. And then this sort of, acts like uh, injecting like chaos into the neural network, which move the neural network like slightly from the order phase to the to the chaotic phase. And then and then in this case we invest the effect of dropout in the last layer. What happens over here is that like uh, it will improve the conditioning number. So for instance uh, in the in the other phase, when there's no no dropouts, we know that the conditioning number will diverge to diverge to infinity exponentially fast, corresponding to the orange curve over here. So the orange curve means that we don't apply dropouts. And then when we look at the purple curve, when we drop only like one percent of the neurons in the last layer. And then the conditioning number converts to a finite constant. As we increase the rate of dropouts, the conditioning number will decrease, meaning the 
generate metrics of the network improve. However, the, it does not change the generalization metrics. Okay, so so this is like the table that uh, summarize our result of this talk. And then we have like a collab for you to play around with like the results of, of this table. And then finally, like uh, we have written a library, if you're familiar with JAX. So this is called Neural Tangents. It will automate the computation of infinite with networks. And all our experiments are using this uh, library. Okay, thanks. I think that's what I have. Uh, Lichao, we have a question about uh, the penultimate uh, heat map you have shown. Um, is why I, is the question? The question is, why is the gap between train and test accuracy so big? Uh, give me one second. It's okay. So, uh, this plot. Oh, I, I think it's the heat map. Uh, mm. Yeah, I think I think this one. Uh, why the chain and test accuracy, the gap between them is so big in which regime? Uh, in, in the, in, in the, this one, the, the, it's this plot, yes. Mm -hmm. and so, so let me explain a little bit over here. So, in this case, like the test is very bad. It's like a 33%. It's very low because we're only using like a 1K of like a training set from like CIFA 10 because CIFA has 50K. And then in, in this case, in the, in the upper right, we already know that like the network basically just memorized the data and it's not able to learn useful things as indicate in in this like uh, in this plot when we have like perfect training accuracy but very bad test accuracy and when you look at the the, the kernel of this form because the kernel is completely not informative because the ndk is just essentially an identity matrix and then it does not capture any correlation between two inputs so this is a reason that like on the upper right, it does not have any decent test accuracy, even though the training accuracy is, is perfect. And then uh, for, for, the, for the region between the white curve and the orange curve, uh, so for this one, I think these are, are the most like a useful region and the fine gray like a Accuracy would depends on the hyperparameters and how it depends on the hyperparameters. Uh, we don't have a solution for that at this moment. And another interesting point is that like uh, the performance of the network is better when it is closer to the chaotic phase, which is like the the like a uh, white dashed line over here. <clears throat> yeah, not so sure whether I answer this question. Uh, he he's actually complimenting his question, uh, asking. So you train in the one K subset, but evolve in the original C four test set uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, evaluating in a split from the one K subset. Yeah, I I think like a train on one K and evaluate on on ten K. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have another question from Pedro Antonio, which is, uh, could you please comment on what are the main open problems in this line of research? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, so for this line, you mean like the NDK or the, so I assume this line means that like a uh, infinite width or like a uh, NDK. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think it means that. So to be honest, 
I think this line of research has done a lot of work and, and then like a not much potential. And the most interesting part is not in this line of research is when the kernel of NDK evolve. So, so in this case, for all the like the results over here is that like during training, the NDK does not change and everything is reduced to kernel. When everything is reducing to kernel, what remains to, to, to do is just analyze the kernel, the property of the kernel. This is like a very classical things. Mm -hmm. This is not, not the key success of like a, of like a modern neural network. So the key success of modern neural network is the evolution of this kernel. And indeed there's like many things that to make this kernel evolve. For instance, we can use a larger learning rate and in particular, a larger number of like training set size to significantly move this kernel theta away from the anti regime. And then in that setting, the kernel will learn the information from the inputs and how to understand the evolution of the kernel I think it's the most difficult, challenging, and most fundamental questions for the for, for deep learning at this moment. Okay, uh, no more questions for now. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Lichal, for being here with us today. Uh, it was an amazing lecture, and we'll see uh, we'll see in the next uh, in the next week with the next lectures. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Have a nice weekend. Nice weekend for you too. Thank you. Bye-bye.